Welcome to lecture 20 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll look at one form of spectrum sensing technique referred to as energy detection. So how does energy detection work? Simply put, energy detection takes the average amount of energy across a band of interest and based on that average, if it exceeds a threshold, we flag it as being occupied by a signal. If that average actually falls below the threshold, then it's deemed that it's not occupied and free to use. So there are several building blocks that constitute an, an energy detector, including a pre-filtering stage, an analog digital conversion stage, a fast Fourier transform stage, and a square law, law device that's applied to the output of the FFT. Then, once we have um, that, that those measurements um, and, and the, uh, uh, that are obtained from the, uh, from the blocks that I've just described, the output of a square law device, we then apply it to a decision-making rule that uses a threshold. And as I described before, uh, that threshold uh, is used to either classify the, the, the spectrum that's under test as being occupied or unoccupied. And we use um, a hypothesis testing where H0 is the hypothesis that the spectrum is actually unoccupied or idle, while H1 means that it is occupied or possesses a signal with, within it. And so what ends up happening is um, the big issue with energy detection is choosing a suitable threshold, because if we don't, what ends up happening is we could have a, a non-negligible probability of false alarm or a probability of misdetection. So that's what we're going to look at right now. So first of all, let's look at the modules of our energy detector. So we have the pre-filtering. So we only filter out the band that's of interest and we filter out everything else. So pre-filter. Then following that, we perform our analog to digital conversion because we want to process the digital data. So that's our analog signal. We get digital samples at the output. We then apply our FFT. Okay. So now what we have are frequency samples that we then pass through the square law device. And what that does is that actually gives us the magnitude squared of the frequency samples. So that gives us what? Energy. And then from the energy, and we, let's say we take multiple observations or measurements, what we do is we average them. We average all those, like let's say n samples at a time, such that it, we average out the noise so we get a better, cleaner resolution of, 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 of the spectrum energy uh, from which we can make a better decision about whether the signal, uh, there's a signal present in that spectrum or not. And so uh, now, given that, Suppose now we're looking at frequency that looks like this. Right? So suppose that is our spectrum. And you might say, okay, um, where should you put the threshold? Well, if you choose the threshold here, right? Well, th that's good. So let's say we, we call this tau. So we know that there is signal present here. Let's say we, I, I intend, I, like for some reason, I'm in a mode where I know everything. So we know that that spectrum is occupied. That spectrum's occupied. That entire spectrum here is occupied. This one too. This one as well and that one. So what happens is, notice how when I set the threshold to be there, I'm missing out on this guy and this guy. So there is some misdetection. So if I start transmitting there, I'm actually interfering with that signal. If I try to accommodate and I set the threshold really low, what might happen is I might hit some uh, noise, some spurious noise that may or may not be an actual signal. So my probability of false alarm is high. So it might deny 
spectrum that might otherwise be available to me. And then, of course, if I set it too high, as in tau 2 over here, then I miss a lot of, um, of, of potential hits, and I might interfere with them if I accidentally transmit in those, their spectrum. So now that we looked at sort of a system point of view to energy detection, as well as looking at some of the scenarios that our energy detector might encounter in terms of choosing, the, uh, choosing a threshold which may or may not be appropriate, let's look at the math a little bit more carefully about the decision-making process. So first of all, let's go back to our hy hypothesis testing structure of H0 and H1, where H0 is only when we have noise present, that's our hypothesis, in the measurement, and H0 is when we have signal plus noise present in the measurement. So let's create a vector y that consists of n of these observation measurements at the receiver. And let's assume that both the noise and the signal possess Gaussian characteristics. They're, they're Gaussian random variables, but with different variances. So as a result, y is actually a random vector. And therefore, it's defined by a joint multidimensional probability density function. And that joint probability density function, in fact, um, uh, is conditional on whether we, we, we have an H1 or an H0 scenario. And hence, using Nyman-Pearson detection, we have something called a log likelihood ratio. And so essentially, this is our litmus test of whether it's signal plus noise or just noise present in that measurement for y. And so what the log likelihood does, it's the log of the ratio of the PDF of y given that h1 has occurred divided by the PDF of y given that h0 has occurred. And tau prime is the threshold. And so using this, uh, we can actually, um, like uh, making several assumptions, we can actually decompose uh, some of this math into what we see here in equation two. We can actually make some sort of um, statistic from all of this uh, z, which is uh, if we assume that uh, the, the measurement samples are independent and identically distributed, we can actually decompose it and simplify things quite a bit um, in order to perform the decision-making process. But as you can see, this, this is already getting a little bit complicated. Because in the, in the next stage, what happens is it's actually vitally important that uh, both the signal and the noise uh, measurement uh, observations are Gaussian because from that we can actually use some of the mathematical tools that we looked at before in order to compute what is the probability that in fact we have an H1 as opposed to an H0. We can actually um, solve for, you based on the statistical characteristics of what we're observing, uh, we can find out what's the probability of having one versus the other. It turns out that if we have these complex Gaussians and then we sum them together, especially the magnitude squared of them, what this creates is essentially a chi-squared uh, probability density function with 2n degrees of freedom. And it kind of gets messy in terms of the mathematics, especially when we have gamma functions and such involved. Um, but from this, we can actually calculate sort of punchline from all this. So, so we have... Um, uh, we know what ga the gamma function is equal to, or in, in specifically the upper incomplete gamma function, which is defined here. And so, in fact, if it's, they're independently distributed, we can actually de decompose the chi square of 2n degrees of freedom into um, a collection of ch uh, chi squared variables um, and, um, and, 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 and just multiply them through. And what this gives us at the end of the day are the probabilities of false alarm and the probabilities of misdetection which are in closed form. So these metrics are very useful in order to tell us how well or how poorly our threshold has been chosen.